Then we have forgiveness of neighbor. It's of enormous importance. It's necessary to have a heart that has nothing against anyone, living or dead. That's a tall order, given the kind of people we are and what we do to one another, including kith and kin, partners and mates, relatives and friends. Very important. There's no, and there's no, uh, no dodging the issue. I mean to say you can, if everybody except her. No. It's the same as the priest's absolution and confession. When you've adequately made a, uh, your confession of your sins, it's a clean slate. You're immaculate. All is forgiven. Well, that's the way we have to be in terms of what happens to us. If Christ forgives us, we forgive. It's as simple as that. It's extremely unhealthy to pretend you can get away with anything less than that. Nothing is worse than to be nurturing grudges and resentments and a lack of forgiveness. You know, we sometimes think it's not inconsistent with Christian love to be unforgiving toward those who wrong us. It may be in our hearts, even though not always recognized. We've suffered a grievous wrong at the hands of elders, leaving deep wounds. Almost everyone somewhere along the line experiences injustice or shameful treatment, including, including religion. I don't mean misunderstandings or blunders or human weakness, but evil. And of course, forgiveness doesn't mean saying it was okay. No, you recognize that what was done was unjust, was unfair, but you still forgive, you know, as he did before he died. Father, forgive them. And as an excuse, he said, they don't know what they're doing. Well, they didn't. And often we don't know what we're doing in other terms of what we do to others. He said, what you do to the least, you do to me. Well, so we have things to think about. <clears throat> and our external behavior is not enough. I mean, you know, to carry on an exterior, that's pleasant, you know even sending a Christmas card. No, it has to be deep in the heart. And it's a mistake to settle for anything less. For if we keep alive such an attitude of unforgiveness and don't think it's a sin, it's very sad. It's a mistake of the first order. When we're younger, we can get away with it. But as we grow older, you know, you can't do it as well as you used to. Activity and preoccupation with other things can keep us blind to what's going on in our heart. When you get older, we may discover that the bitterness in our depths has become a kind of cancer that has spread. It may cloud our whole outlook, it may manifest itself in daily life. A genuine bitterness may touch everything we say and do and think. The unforgiving attitude that was once confined to some small instance has now become general. Whole life is embittered. Same with her. So, and if you're not up to it, you pray for it, you know. We think we can control it to one particular event. No, there's no exceptions, no matter how justified. Lack of forgiveness is never justified. You cannot get away with it. And we bring on ourselves a terrible judgment. How can you say they are Father? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. On the other hand, if you do forgive, you know, you're in for something beautiful. Because when you enter, you'll say, come on in. You forgave everyone, they, what they did to you. I forgive you and everything you did to me. That'll sound good. So a good preparation for heaven and the mercy of God is to show it to others. And if you're not up to it, pray for it. It's his program. <clears throat> I mean, you know, what good is a program if you don't get the wherewithal to do it? Pious talk isn't enough. And he does provide the wherewithal. So if you're stuck with something, you know, in a, like in something in your throat, that you can't over, you turn to him and tell him, I'm not going to make it the way I'm going. I hear you. Your program is beautiful. I buy every word of it, but I can't do it. So help me. I guarantee you, he will. I guarantee you, he will. You just keep asking until you get it. And if you die that night, you're okay. Your compass is in the right direction. You're not there yet, but you're on the right road. So in other words, there's nothing to lose.
<clears throat> well, the worst one is the last one, ourself. There's where the lack of mercy becomes most obvious. I don't know why. For one thing, we come into the world slightly blemished. That's original sin. Then maybe the beginnings were not all that great. I mean, your people may have been good people, but not particularly competent. Okay? Then if you're a little bit unusual, uh, kids will pick on you. You know, if there's something wrong with you, uh, you know, whatever it be, big ears or, you know, anything. The kids can pick on, they will. That can hurt. Kids can be cruel, even nice kids. And then you start committing sins of your own. Well, they're not a big deal, but to a child they are. That's why we have children go to confession, so they learn how to deal with evil and the mercy of God. And then, of course, he, he, he gets into the realms of religion and he thinks humility means feeling bad about yourself. No, it doesn't. Humility means honesty. And the honesty track tells us that we're sinners who are Christian, and that means our sins are forgiven. We never forget either one. And that keeps us from that horrible sin of the pious self-righteousness. We're sinners, every one, and we know that. But we're not guilt-ridden. We're Christians, our sins are forgiven. That's workable, you know. So we must learn to forgive ourselves also. You hear people say that, I can never forgive myself. It's not Christian. I don't care what you've done. We must forgive. Merciless condemnation for our faults, our way of failings, our weaknesses. A lot of it comes from our culture. It's a competitive culture. We learned it early, before kindergarten. Winners get the prize. Losers get nothing. So we're taught early on to watch the competition. You know, keep your eye on the, you know, the rest. Always comparing yourself. Oh, that can be a bad beginning. This, this uh, competitive streak and then lots of aggression. You know, they want excellence. How do you get excellence? Well, pit one against the other. They do it in Juilliard and they get geniuses. Doctors, lawyers, any professional school wants excellence. And how do we get excellence? Compete, honey. Pit one against the other. Well, then one is obviously the loser. That can be hard and can destroy, destroy a, the whole person, you know. And then we condemn ourselves. Mercifully, oh, your mother is a put-down artist, or your father was a perfectionist, you know, a control freak, whatever. And we pick that up without even knowing it. And that's the way we treat ourselves. You can do better than this, you know, what the hell's the matter with you? And so on. It becomes merciless. So we got to work on that. And it's common in pious people because it gets identified with some sort of striving for perfection of some sort. Listen to Mark Hopkins. You know, Gerard Manny Hopkins, upper class, Oxford, wealthy, brilliant, mystic, what else? Poet, Jesuit, priest. How much do you need, you know, to amount to anything? Riddled with guilt. My own heart, let me more have pity on. Let me live to my own sad self hereafter. Kind, charitable, not live this tormented mind with this tormented mind, tormenting yet. That's perfect. Any of you who know what this syndrome is, nagging spirit, this tormented mind, <laughs> tormenting, you know, you know, unending nagging. I cast for comfort I can no more get by groping round my comfortless than thirst can find its all in all in a world of wet. You're drowning at sea and you can't drink it, and you're dying of thirst and you can't drink it because it's salt water. I do admire you, jaded, let be. Call off thoughts a while elsewhere. Leave comfort room, room. Man, that's right on. Leave comfort root room. So, there's a big uh, market here, I mean, a world of uh, dire need. And if you, the giveaway will be if you're a uh, fault-finding critic of your brother or your sister, quick to notice flaw, blemish. You may not say anything, but you're sharp. Don't miss anything. Well, 
and you know faults, failings, slips, all that. Because you're a competitor, you're always comparing and so on. Yeah. Well, it isn't Christian. That's the way you treat yourself, though. And you think the cure lies in trying to be decent to other people. You're wasting your breath. You start at home. Start practicing mercy on this person within. And then the, your neighbor will be a pushover. But you're wasting your time if you start with your neighbor because you're constantly contradicting yourself. So it's worth thinking on. There's no sense denying the darkness of despair that makes its presence felt in our hearts. Drove Martin Luther away from a monastic life. He was a good monk in a good monastery, but he didn't reach what he thought was perfection. Threw it away. Threw it away. Faith alone. We're not justified by works. He thought that was a new teaching. It isn't. It's Christian teaching. We're not justified by good works. You cannot win heaven. It's already won. Your good works are simply a response to his love. So the competitive aspect is irrelevant. I hear you love me. Thank you. I love you too. Maybe there's something I could, I could do for you. Well, as a matter of fact, there is. What is it? Well, you could practice mercy, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, patience. You could feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick, bury the dead, that sort of thing. Oh, hell, I can do that. But I don't do it to win his love. I do it to answer it. That's a whole different thing. Completely different. I do it to answer his love for me. Wretched sinner that I am, I am loved by Jesus Christ, God Almighty. And that being so, and his love is the same for all people, therefore I can be a man of mercy. There's no denying the darkness of despair that, meets, uh, that many people cope with. However, a constant inner nagging, unending belittling, a manner of blaming, reproaching, condemning ourselves without mercy doesn't please God. It's an insult to him. For it presumes our salvation and our sanctification is our doing, which is absurd. That if we beat the beast without mercy, without stint, eventually he'll do what he's supposed to do. No. If we show mercy, we'll see it and give it and get it also to ourselves. One of your neighbors is you. And we're supposed to love our neighbor. Among those others, oddly enough, is the one. He was hard on himself, but kind to others. You hear that said sometimes. It's absurd. It's impossible. If you're hard on others, if you're hard on yourself, you'll be hard to others too. You know. One is merciful uh, or, or one isn't. You can't be merciful to one and hateful to another. Nor love your neighbor and condemn another neighbor. Mercy is all or nothing. If you condemn yourself, you're condemning your neighbor's brother. And that ain't the law. That's against the law. Good to reflect on these truths. Being unforgiving towards God isn't rare. People will leave the church to let God know that they're unhappy about the way things are. He'll get it. What I, he'll, he'll, he'll know what I mean. Mm. Unforgiving toward neighbor is common. The worst and the most common is to be unforgiving to yourself. We must enter the realms of mercy and dwell there and in its happy precincts. Mercy received and mercy given being the realm of the, the coin of the realm. And the wealth of God's love becomes the richest available to all. And then we can pray without fear, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. It's beautiful. These are good things to think on. We shouldn't assume that we, you know, are all that good at it in terms of forgiveness. So total, you know, total gift, you know, a complete coverage. And in it is a great deal of peace, a great deal of happiness. Okay? God bless you. Thank you. See you tomorrow.